Guy Vanderhaeg, our guest, he is a premier writer in this country, one of the best, uh, top of the charts, as they say. <laughs> well, you're making me. Well, you're making me blush, actually. Well, you don't have to be humble anymore, <laughs> because you're making money, you know, and uh, selling lots of books. How many are, are these translated in many different languages? Uh, yeah, well, my, my, my books in the past, they started out tending to be translated into Scandinavian uh, languages, uh, but you know, French, um, mm -hmm. et, cetera, et cetera. Sure. Well, when this book is written about by critics, it, they call it, he, he writes about the last of the Wild West. What do you think that means, the last of the Wild West? You know, I'm, I'm not actually quite certain what they mean, but I, I think I, I've devoted three books to the 1870s mm -hmm. uh, in a particular place and time, which I think of as being a, a time of radical change. In the 1870s, many of the native peoples were still living a traditional way of life by the late 70s and the early 80s, they had been basically forced to sign treaties mm -hmm. uh, and were, were, were being kept on reserves. Uh, and that began, I think, the period of the destruction of language, culture, religion, um, and ag again, their only means of sustenance mm -hmm. was the buffalo. The buffalo was basically gone. Uh, by 1883, 1884, yeah. so you, you, you see a people undergoing a catastrophic change, and it happens in a decade. And what is egalitarian about it? Not much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the differences between the cultures, the, the U.S. And, and Canada, and I'm sure if people aren't historians, they don't really know uh, what Sitting Bull did when he sat here. Yes. Or came yeah. here, and the, yeah. and the strong Canadian connection to the Battle of the Little Bighorn and, and the demise of Custer and all of that. For instance, a, a, a Sitting Bull always claimed that the Canadian government owed him land because the Sioux people had been allies of the British in the War of 1812. Right. Uh, and and he, he often spoke of himself as being a Canadian Indian. Uh, that he, he, he once claimed that he was born in the Red River uh, country in, mm -hmm. in, in Manitoba. So it's very, in, I mean, natives, Native peoples had no conception of a border um, until the, the, the boundary was surveyed in, in the 1860s. They began to call it the medicine line at that point because it seemed to them to have magical properties. Mm -hmm. That if you did something in the United States and you rode across the border, you were relatively safe because the U.S. cavalry or army couldn't right. fo follow you across this border. Sure, but after Custer, didn't they fear that the, uh, uh, the Indians would get together in Canada, uh, different tribes, and uh, start another revolution or continue the revolution and there would be another Custer massacre? Well, and it, who was going to tell the Americans what was going on? How was it going to work? Yeah, I, th th well, that was one of the things that, that Sitting Bull attempted to do was forge alliances with other tribes who had been traditional enemies of, of the Sioux. Mm -hmm. And he was making overtures in that period to the Assiniboine, to the Blackfoot, right. even the Cree, and even Canadian uh, Métis. Um, so he became, I think, for, for he's, he became a very dangerous figure at this point for both, I think, the Canadian and American governments because you, you can't ever predict what what might happen uh -huh. uh, in, in their minds, and and if there was a grand confederation of Indian nations, it would have actually been more dangerous to sovereignty in Canada than the United States because we didn't have troops on the ground here. We had right. something like 270 policemen occupying Alberta, Saskatchewan. And as you know, um, uh, Americans, I am one. And I'm a dual citizen now, mm. so I can say I'm half. Yeah. Uh, but greedy, <laughs> you know. Once we, if we get on the land, we just might take it. That, mm -hmm. I mean, again, that was always a concern too of of the Canadian government. Of course. That that uh, if America, if enough American settlers or even the American army crossed the border uh, to deal with the Sioux or any other Native people, they might 
not go back home. Right. Um, so it, it was a just form a new state. Yeah. And <laughs> Why it, not? In, in, in fact, uh, that was the the, the Fenian plan. Uh, they w once launched a, a failed invasion of Canada, the, the Irish revolutionaries in, in in the states, and they wanted to go into Manitoba, uh, make an alliance with the Métis, declare themselves a republic, and they they had support from certain senators mm. and. U.S. congressman, and then ask for statehood. Interesting. When you did the research, uh, and I know you do a lot of research, uh, and went to the Western Museums and the archives, anything startle you about what was going on then or how it's emerged? You know, it's really about this, the essence of this book, I think, is finding how people find a place or we find a place in a newly emerging social order, be it in the 1800s or the 1900s or the 2000s. I think one of the most startling things might have been is the, the, the independent activities of women in the West. Um, for instance, like the Homestead Act actually gave women an equal right to the property that, with their husbands, which was extraordinary at that point of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was both in the Western United States and Western Canada that women often got the vote sooner um, they did than they did in in other jurisdictions in both Canada and the United States. Um, you know, pioneer women are sometimes kind of projected or shown um, as helpmates. To the to the males, mm -hmm. but they had a they had an independence. I think, or often had an independence at that time that was extraordinary. A survival, a calamity yeah. Jane yeah. part of them that had yeah. to survive because maybe the husband didn't, right. or you know, it's tough times and often tough yeah, stock. Yes, and often got uh, in, involved in quasi political activity mm. and I like educational. That. I don't think we got the vote till 1920 or something. Yeah, yeah, but. But, but uh, um, the thing about 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 th these pioneer women, I think, um, is it's often f f forgotten that they were the educators of children. Uh, they they had societies uh, that gave them a certain amount of of support, uh, mm -hmm. you know, w w with each other. So it the West is often, p I think depicted in literature and movies and things like that and the only people that you might see is the school marm and the saloon girl or the dance hall right. girl but we kind of forget how active women were and how important they were to the formation of society. Mm -hmm. Well they weren't all Miss Kitties. No. <laughs> <laughs> no but when you played Cowboys and Indians and I did is that politically correct anymore? I don't know no, if, it, if it, you can. It, it, I, I wouldn't be You can't but I was correct. always the Indian princess. Aha uh -huh, good. What were you? I, I was almost always the Indian. And one of the reasons that I was almost always the Indian was that I had a, a Pinto Shetland pony. Uh, so I, of course. I, came, I came fully equipped. I had a Pinto too, but not Did a you? Shetland. Yes, ah, yeah, risky. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, brown and white, My, really fat. Mine was Patches. And, okay. patch, and Patches was fat too. Risky and Patches. Okay, so tonight. You will be speaking about the Wild West, about a good man, at Waterfront Theater at 8 p.m. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Guy Vanderhag, uh, third in the trilogy, a good man, and he is. Coming up, Dennis, you see I'm flattering you again. I don't know what that's about.